So last session, we stopped here with uh, don't stop pre-training. And the idea was the task of transfer learning. It's not a, it's not like, it's, an, it's, not, a, it's not a binary task. It's not uh, like you pre-train once and then you fine tune on your target task. There could be a spectrum of uh, intermediate pre-training steps that could happen from a large corpus, which could be related to the downstream task or not, to a domain that is a little bit more relevant to your task, to a domain that is really, really relevant, but uh, it has unlabeled data, and then to the task itself, where you could have small data for it. And that's the idea of transfer learning. And a good example was the Amazon reviews. For a specific product, all of the Amazon reviews, all of reviews on the web for any product, which could be from Amazon on Amazon's website or no, or the entire web. And we saw that this is actually useful. And the idea is keep pre-training and keep adapting. Let's move on to cross-lingual language model pre-training. So it's an assignment for you to watch that video. I'm going to go through this really fast, but then uh, in the meantime, you can think of questions. And then I'm going to stop and I'm going to stop for questions. What do we have? We have multiple languages and we want to do cross-language pre-training. So far, we were focusing on a single language. What happens if you have multiple languages? Uh, are there any transfer happening? Is there anything in common between these languages? And can you pre-train pre on multiple of them? The method is XLM, cross-lingual language models. You could have monolingual data, or you could have parallel data. For monolingual corpora, you have independently collected data sets for each one of those languages. And then each one of them is going to have a size. For some of the languages, you have a lot of data. For instance, English, there is a lot of document on the web in English, or even in Chinese, you have a lot of documents. But for some other languages, you have very few data maybe in Nepali. This is the type of data that we're going to be working with. You could also have parallel data in the form of translations. You have pairs of input-output data. If you have that, then that's a luxury. And if you don't have it, we want to have a generic method that's going to be able to do, to do the transfer across these languages. The key challenge is how are you going to model your vocabulary? How are you going to tokenize your text? Are you going to tokenize each one of them independently? Or are you going to tokenize jointly? We are going to be using Viper encoding or even sentence piece is going to be much better. The idea is uh, learn your tokens on the concatenation of sentences that you are going to sample at random from each one of these corpuses. Now the question is how are you going to sample? Some of the languages are going to have a lot of data. Some of the languages are going to have very few data. And then you don't want to be biased towards the languages that have a lot of data. You don't want these tokens to be biased and model only English, for instance. We know that we have to sample according to some ratio. So this is just a fact. There is no way around it. The question is, how are you going to come up with these cues? If you pick the ratio, according to the sizes of these corpuses, without this alpha, then uh, you are actually biased towards the languages that have a lot of data. And the ones that have very few data are going to end up being negligible, these Ps. And you are not going to be sampling sentences from them. To compensate for that, you can take a square root of P. The values that are big, you are taking the square root of them. For instance, for English, you are taking the square root of the p, and this way you're mitigating that, that uh, imbalance in the data distribution across these languages. But then as soon as you take the square root, the summation of the square roots of pi's are not going to add up to 1 anymore. You have to adjust for that again. You need to divide by the magnitude or by the total value. And this is the way that you're going to alleviate the bias. You're not going to be able to remove it, but you're helping the problem. At least you are going to keep sampling from the low-resource languages. And then the rest of it is uh, what we do for 
a usual language model. You could have causal language model, where given the past, you are predicting the future. This is the decoder part of a transformer. You can have mass language modeling. In the style of BERT, you mask some of these tokens, and then you are asking your model, your transformer, to give you the answer, what was masked at this location. We know that we have to do positional embedding, and then uh, there is this language embedding, because our data is, we want to know which data we are currently looking at. So intuitively speaking, this makes sense. You want to have an indicator of which data you're considering, which language, okay? If you have the luxury of having pairs of data or a translation, which is basically labeled data, then uh, you can still work with your BERT model, but then uh, you're going to concatenate your sentences. A sentence in English, the corresponding translation in French, then you have to say which language you're looking at. So you need the language embeddings. Then you're going to need positional embeddings for each language. And then you're going to mask at random. Some of your words are going to end up being English. Some of them are going to end up being French. And then you're going to train your transformer. And then you can take a look at the results. In uh, multiple test cases, here is 15 XNLI. So that data set I want you guys to explore. It's going to be in different languages. And then uh, in the video, I explain what is the actual strategy for testing for some of these classification tasks, for unsupervised machine translation, where you don't have labeled data for it. Only when you're testing, you know the labels. And then you can have supervised machine translation or the perplexity of your language models on low resource and high resource languages. For instance, if you look at Nepali, the perplexity is going to go down. It's a low resource language. As the perplexity goes down, your model is less confused and it's modeling your data better. And there is some transfer happening here from English data and Hindi data to Nepali. Any questions about XLM? And why is this important? Because many of the companies that exist today are uh, spanning across geographic locations. For instance, they have satellite offices. Maybe their headquarters is in the US or perhaps their headquarters is in China, but then they have satellite offices across the entire globe. And whenever that happens, you're gonna have customers that are gonna speak in different languages. One option for your customers is to go and learn English or Chinese, and then they can interact with your product and perhaps buy them. The other one is for you to be flexible, have a flexible website to do the translation on its own, to have uh, sentiment analysis uh, for different products and reviews written in their respective languages. So that's the idea. That's why having a framework to deal with multiple languages is really useful. Okay, any questions about XLM?